All right, tell me when, you, when you're ready. Good. Okay. All right, I um, have quite a bit of things to do today, um, and quite a lot of somewhat subtle things, so you're going to want to do your best, pay attention, take good notes. I'm going to be making some drawings on the board that are are important to really pay attention to not only what I draw, but all how I talk about them. Um, I'm going to start by talking about the extra reading assignment uh, and some of the harder details that are at the end of that. By the way, it's not quite your last reading assignment. I'm going to do extra reading assignment. I'm going to do one more over the weekend. Um, that will also be a challenge, but these, again, are important things in my mind to sort of get a bigger picture about things, even though they're not in the book. Uh, I think they are they're things that are interesting and important and worth getting, getting into, especially if you want to give some meaning to the flow idea. Then we'll go back and talk about things from the book with Hamiltonian systems and something new called a dissipative system. Well, let's start here for class 34 by looking at this extra reading. Uh, again, the hyperbolicity thing, that's, that's easier than the stability concepts. Let me quickly review the hyperbolicity fact, the definition and the hartman groban theorem here, and just try to point out some things that may have been confusing still. Um, and also talk about some intuitive reasons why uh, we make this such a definition. So again, a definition of a hyperbolic equilibrium point um, is a, it's an equilibrium point of a given nonlinear autonomous system, so f of y, that vector field there is nonlinear in general. It's hyperbolic if um, the corresponding linearized system has no eigenvalues with zero real part. So no eigenvalues that are zero, and no eigenvalues that are purely imaginary. In the trace determinant plane, what does that mean? Think about that. And we'll continue thinking about the trace determinant plane. You know, you've got the three critical loci, the t-axis, the repeated root parabola, d equals t squared over 4, and the positive d-axis. What would it mean if you're a hyperbolic equilibrium point as far as the tracing determinant? It would mean, for one thing, you're not on the t-axis, where zero is an eigenvalue. We saw that when you're on the t-axis, that's when zero is an eigenvalue. And you're also not on the positive d-axis, where you've got purely imaginary eigenvalues, where the origin for that linearized system is a center. Okay, so that's where you've got to avoid if you want to be a hyperbolic equilibrium point. J of Y0, that is the Jacobian matrix. There is a corresponding linearized system using this new variable U. It is a linear function of U. The origin for that system is an equilibrium point that corresponds to the perhaps non-origin equilibrium point for the, for the nonlinear system. All right. And the significance of that, for the most part for us, comes from the hartman groban theorem, okay, which basically says that when, you've got a, when you have a hyperbolic equilibrium point, the linearized system tells you what the nonlinear system looks like near that hyperbolic equilibrium point. You can say it in terms of the flow, the flow can be related, for this is for the nonlinear system, to the flow for the, for the linearized system. This is using the matrix exponential there, by the way, that wasn't clear. e to the t times j, j is the Jacobian matrix. That's a matrix exponential of t times that matrix, times the vector u. That's a linear function of u. That's a linear flow. When you think of t as a fixed, it's a linear function of u. That's the flow for the linearized system. And you're saying those two functions, this nonlinear flow and this linearized flow, are related to each other by something called a topological equivalence, which, roughly speaking, means they behave in similar ways. OK? And that's what we've seen with linearization, is the linearized system tells you what the nonlinear system looks like near the equilibrium point. Hyperbolic equilibrium points, um, another way to think about them, is there what's called structurally, structurally stable? If you change the vector field a little bit near that point, it stays hyperbolic. It stays a sink or source, stays a saddle point. If you change the vector field just a little bit, that's called structural stability. Not a 
hyperbolic equilibrium points are not, in general, structurally, structurally stable. If you perturb, change the vector field a little bit, they could change. For example, if the nonlinear hyperbolic e uh, uh, equilibrium point happens to be a center, and we're actually going to see some examples of that today with Hamiltonian systems, um, if you change the vector field a little bit, it could fail to be a center. It could be a spiral sink or a spiral source. And again, there was an example in the book like that. Can I clarify anything? I hope you're doing your best to pay attention. I know these are sort of difficult concepts. And it gets even more difficult with stability. So let's focus on that now. You've got these three definitions here of what it means for an equilibrium point to be what's called the off and off stable, unstable, or asymptotically stable. What does the off and off stable mean? It's a complicated definition. There it is. The best way in my mind to try to understand such a definition is to draw pictures. Okay, and so I'm going to do that. So with the camera, we're going to have to kind of go back and forth somewhat between the screen and the board here. I'm going to start to draw something on the board. I'm going to draw an equilibrium point, and I'm going to pretend it's a center, even though the system could be nonlinear. So I've got solution curves that are periodic solutions near this equilibrium point say, going counterclockwise. I claim such an equilibrium point is stable, according to this definition. What does that mean? Let's go back to this definition. It says, if for all epsilon, that, that's Greek letter epsilon, it's a positive number. For all positive numbers epsilon greater than zero, no matter how small, there exists another number called delta greater than zero, so that, think of this expression as being the, representing the distance between y and y0. y0 is an equilibrium point for the nonlinear system. y is an arbitrary point. This expression with the double absolute value signs, think of that as representing the distance between y and y0. It's pretty standard notation. If that's less than delta, then the output of the flow also has a distance from y0 that's less than something else, it's less than the given epsilon, for all t greater than or equal to 0. That's kind of a hard thing to try to understand. Let's go back to the picture here and try to understand it. I hope you wrote it down. It would be good to have it in your notes, even though it's up on here. The best way to think about this with a picture is to draw pictures of disks centered at this point, y0. So there's y0. There is your equilibrium point. I start with a given epsilon. Epsilon typically is thought of as being a small number, arbitrarily small. It doesn't matter how small it is. Draw a disk of radius epsilon centered at the equilibrium point. So I'm drawing a circle of radius epsilon. I'm, I'm thinking of that as not being a circle but being a disk, meaning it's the entire circle and the part inside the circle. Epsilon really represents the radius of that disk. All points that are inside this disk have a distance to y0 that is less than epsilon. Actually, it's what's called an open disk, which means you actually do not include the circle itself as part of the set. I can emphasize that by putting a dashed boundary here. Every point inside that open disk has a distance to that point, the equilibrium point, that's less than epsilon. And I'm saying this point is going to be stable if, no matter how small that disk is, you can find another disk of radius delta. Perhaps delta has to be really small so that the output of the flow, meaning the solution curve really, stays within the given epsilon of the equilibrium point for all positive t. I need to be able to find another disk, possibly smaller. It has to be smaller, actually. So that if I start with an initial condition inside that smaller disk, 
it's going to stay inside the bigger disk for all time. How small does the other disk have to be? Well, I purposely made these solution curves look like ellipses to make, make sure that delta needs to be fairly small. When would a solution starting in there stay in there for all time? It looks to me like if I imagine my elliptical looking solutions being about this big and say touching these points for this particular drawing, if you make your delta disk this big or smaller, where the, these points are touching, that basically should work. Does that make sense? If you, because if you start in this disk, you're going to stay in the bigger disk as time goes by, even if you're near the edge. Now, to play it safe, maybe I want to make it even smaller. Even if you're at the top edge of this as your initial condition, you're going to stay inside the bigger disk for all positive time. Probably better talk about that again. Look at this definition again. It's hard to make the transition, I think, and it's hard to keep it all in your mind. The equilibrium point is going to be stable, and again, I claim the center is stable. If for all epsilon greater than zero, that's the bigger disk. But that bigger disk could be arbitrarily small. Epsilon could be 10 to the negative million power for all you know. Okay? It could be an un unimaginably small number. There exists another number, even smaller, so that if I stay, if I start, if Y is an initial condition within a distance of delta of that equilibrium point, then effectively the solution is all, always within the epsilon of that equilibrium point. If you start in the smaller disk, you're going to stay in the bigger disk. The bigger disk has distance has radius epsilon, the smaller disk has radius delta. I'm trying to argue that for this given picture and this given disk of radius epsilon, a disk this small approximately or smaller, if I start in there with an initial condition there, in there, the solution curve is going to stay inside the bigger disk. All right, there's our initial attempt at trying to understand that one. I think this is going to be worth talking about again. Let's talk about the next one with the, with the picture. An equilibrium point is unstable if it's not Lyapunov stable. It's the opposite concept. What does that mean? You have to do what's called negate this definition, which is kind of a tricky concept. But here's what it means to negate that definition. There exists, there is an epsilon greater than zero. There is some disk centered at y0 of radius epsilon. So that for all delta, for your other disk, no matter how small, there is a point y, an initial condition in there. y0 is the equilibrium point here. When I think about this definition, I'm imagining y itself as being an initial condition. And some number t greater than zero, so that if you start in that really tiny disk, perhaps, Eventually, you get outside of the other disk. That's unstability. What are examples of unstable equilibrium points? Well, sources and saddles are your typical kinds of unstable equilibrium points. Let's think about a saddle point. Think about a nonlinear saddle point. So you don't necessarily have straight line solutions. Stable separatrix going toward the saddle point as t increases. An unstable separatrix going away from the saddle point as t increases. What do the other solution curves look like? Well, think about it. We've seen examples. They've got to look about like this. I claim this point, this saddle point, is unstable according to this definition. Look at the definition again. There is some epsilon. There is some given disk. So that for all delta, for all other disks, 
no matter how small, emphasis on no matter how small, there is some initial condition inside that smaller disk, perhaps smaller at least, and some T where you eventually get outside the bigger disk. Typically we think of delta as being smaller than epsilon, though that doesn't have to be according to that definition. What should epsilon be? It really doesn't matter for this example. I could pick epsilon to be, say, some positive number. I could even pick epsilon to, say, equal 1 or 0.1. It doesn't matter. Some positive number, some positive radius, and that's my given disk centered at the equilibrium point. Y0 is the equilibrium point. So that's my given disk. The definition continues and says, there, for all delta, no matter how small, I'll put the emphasis on no matter how small by making it small. There, for all delta disks like that, there's some y, there's some initial condition inside that disk so that the solution curve eventually gets outside the other disk. Eventually. Well, how should you pick the initial condition inside this disk? Don't pick it along the sta stable separatrix. You pick it along the stable separatrix, it's not going to go outside of the bigger disk. But if you pick any other point, it will eventually go outside the bigger disk in this picture. No matter what other point you pick, as long as it's not on the stable separatrix, say I pick this point right there, the solution curve is eventually going to go outside of the other disk. over here. It's eventually going to go out. Just don't pick it on that stable separatrix. So that's how you try to make sense about difficult definitions like this. In my mind, that's the best way to make sense out of it, is to draw pictures. It's also nice to have particular examples with numbers. And that's what I've got further down here. I've got particular examples with some numbers, but it'll be better. I often do it with arbitrary numbers like this A here. You could plug in specific numbers if you wanted to for A. So here I have actual calculations, but it's good to think about the pictures too. To help you try to understand it. Okay, so this is our second attempt at understanding this reading more deeply. It's not something you're going to get right away. Okay? It takes time. What should you be able to do for the final exam? We'll come to that. It's possible. I might have you make drawing like this, or maybe I'll give you a drawing like one of these. And you need to essentially explain what I just tried to explain to you, based on the drawing and based on drawing the disks and how it's related to the definition. Sort of like a short essay. I'm not looking for super amount of rigor. I'm looking for getting the right basic idea. Okay? And I think it's worth doing. Why is this important? Why is stability and instability important? Um, it's related to real-life models. Basically, you think of stable equilibrium points and what's called asymptotically stable as well, which I'm not talking about today, as being observable, and unstable equilibrium points as being not observable, as far as what you would see in real life. For example, think about the pendulum. So here's my arm. My arm is the pendulum swinging back and forth. The equilibrium point where it stays straight down, meaning in, uh, velocity and position are both zero, is stable. I can observe that. It's also asymptotically stable when you've got friction in the sense that not only uh, do solution curves stay near there as time goes by, near that equilibrium point, but they even approach it because of friction, that pendulum is eventually going to stop, essentially. What's an example of an unstable equilibrium point? How about if the pendulum's pointing straight up? Technically speaking, if you could somehow balance that pendulum straight up perfectly, it would stay there. But that's not practical. That's not realistic. Nobody can do it. Not even a machine could do it. Because it has to be exactly pointing straight up in the pendulum model. Any tiny little breeze is going to move it away from that equilibrium and it's going to move back and forth. 
and eventually, because of friction, slow down to equilibrium down here. So that's unstable. You can't, you can't really see it. You can't really observe it in real life. With competing species models, for example, uh, saddle points are unobservable. What we saw, typically, is that one of the other species dies off. You don't typically approach the saddle point. You'd have to be exactly on that stable separatrix to approach it. And I'd mentioned this before. It's probably impossible for most nonlinear systems to pick, pick, pick an initial condition exactly on a stable separatrix. In most situations, that's going to be impossible. You're going to be off just a tiny bit. And that's going to mean you're not actually going to approach that saddle point. The stable separatrices do exist, but you can't really observe them. Does that make sense? That's, that's the importance of stability versus unstability. Stable equilibria are things you can observe. Unstable equilibria, equilibria are things you really can't observe in real life. You, you don't observe them with probability one. OK, so that's our next attempt at understanding this. And again, there is going to be one more reading assignment, extra reading assignment, that I'm going to get you um, get out to you over the weekend. All right, let's talk more about our, uh, Hamiltonian systems and the pendulum. And we'll I will continue in the context of Hamiltonian systems and the pendulum to talk about hyperbolic equilibria and stability versus instability. I will still talk about those things. So I'm going to bring this, the conversation into those contexts. So here again is the ideal pen, pendulum. Um, what was the differential equation? Ideal means no friction. I didn't put that word in there on Wednesday. Ideal pendulum. No friction. Never really happens in real life as far as I know. There's always friction. Remember that we focused on the differential equation for the angular variable. Here's your bob. Theta measures this angle. Positive if it's this way. Negative if the bob is over here. There's the way the equation looked. The mass of the bob turned out to be irrelevant in the ideal case with no friction. G is the acceleration due to gravity. L is the length of the pendulum. And theta again is this angle. It's a nonlinear equation. By the way, one other thing that means is that if you add two solutions of this, you do not necessarily get a solution. The linearity principle doesn't hold anymore. I'll say that again. If you add two solutions to this, you don't necessarily get a, another solution. It's because of the nonlinearity there with the sine and theta. If that sine theta were a theta, you really would have an undamped harmonic oscillator, which is linear. It's almost like a harmonic oscillator when theta is small. Catch this. When theta is small, When theta is close to zero, sine theta is close to theta. Look at their graphs. There's the graph of sine theta, the function of theta. Here's the graph of theta. When theta is close to zero, those graphs are close together. In fact, that's the tangent line to the graph there at zero. They're not only close together, but they they get closer together as theta goes to zero pretty fast. So replacing sine theta with a theta gives you a harmonic oscillator. And solutions to this should therefore be close to solutions of a harmonic oscillator when theta is close to zero. And that's what we see when we look at the phase plane down here. I 
added in some equilibrium points. Didn't have those in class the other day. Theta is starting out fairly close to zero. You're seeing a solution curve that is periodic. It's a closed curve. And it looks like an ellipse, just like solutions of harmonic oscillators look like ellipses. But because of this non-linearity, it turns out that's not an, exactly an ellipse. It's not exactly an ellipse. And the deviation from an ellipse gets more extreme as your initial condition gets further from the origin, especially as you get close to this other equilibrium point. At theta equals pi, that's theta equals pi there, which corresponds to the pendulum being straight up. What's going on there with this solution? We're not seeing it as time goes by. Maybe we should do that. Maybe we should let time go by as part of the animation here. Let me change this 100 to a b and make b an animation parameter. Starting just barely bigger than zero and going up to 100. Now we'll see the solution curve get traced out as time goes by pretty quickly. Maybe I shouldn't go up to 100. Try going up to 10 instead. Okay, that's corresponding to a small period, a small amplitude oscillation. Theta, the angle, and V, the angular velocity. V is an angular velocity here. Sometimes the book actually just calls it a velocity, but it's really an angular velocity in radians per second, say. They ask, this corresponds to a small amplitude oscillation. However, as my initial condition here moves closer to theta equals pi, V equals zero, now watch the solution. It goes faster and slower. Slow at first, then it goes fast when it's here and here. It goes slow when it's near those equilibria. What does that mean physically? It means if you start out close to straight up, it is going to move slowly at first, like this. It's moving slower. The velocities, V itself is close to zero and stays close to zero for a while. And then it moves faster as it's going down to the bottom. That's just what you would expect. This model's pretty predicting that. Because there's no friction, we can also make it go around and around and around. One of these kind of solution curves. Notice V is staying positive there. Theta keeps increasing. I just keep going around and around and around. V stays positive. It's not constant. It gets higher and lower. It's going to go faster here in the bottom than it goes to the top. It's going to be more like this. That, that's going to be the motion that this is describing. It's an example of a Hamiltonian system. Um, I made a mistake at the end of class the other day when I wrote down the Hamiltonian function here. If you write this equation as a system in the usual way by letting v equal theta prime, so your first equation is theta prime equals v, v prime equals negative g over l sine theta, and let's take Take L equal to 1. Just to keep things simpler here. I claim this was Hamiltonian, meaning there's a Hamiltonian function, which is going to be related to the total energy, potential plus kinetic, though not necessarily exactly equal to it, related such that the right-hand side of the first equation is the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian function with respect to the second variable. And the right
right hand side of the second equation is going to be the opposite of the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian function with respect to the first derivative. In fact, any time the right-hand side of the first equation only depends on the second variable, and the right-hand side of the second equation only depends on the first variable, this, this first right-hand side only depends on v, the second right-hand side only depends on theta, any time that happens, the system will be Hamiltonian. Though there are plenty of examples where that doesn't happen, but the system still is Hamiltonian. And you can find h by direct integration, integrate that one with respect to v, you get one half e squared plus some constant that depends on the other variable theta. Not really a constant then, but it does depend on theta instead of v. Integrate that. I made the mistake of thinking I just needed to integrate this to find how it depends on theta, which caused me to put a plus g cosine theta here. But I don't really want to integrate that because that is the opposite of this derivative. I really do want to integrate this thing without the minus sign. I want to integrate the opposite of v prime, this right hand side. I want to integrate g sine theta, which is going to give me minus g cos theta. The most important thing to realize about this is that the Hamiltonian function's values are conserved. It's like energy being conserved. And in fact, it is related to energy. This is related to the kinetic energy. This is related to the potential energy. Though especially with the potential in, in physics, they typically take it to be something a little different. If H is conserved, what that means is that the solution curves must lie on top of the so-called level curves of H. So I'm typing H in here. Let's go ahead and we're taking G to be 9.8. We're going to use standard units. Minus 9.8 cos theta. I'm using contour plot right here to plot a bunch of level curves of H, meaning a bunch of curves in this plane, this theta v plane on which the values of the function h are constant. That's what level curves are. If you had multi, you should know that already. Contour plot plots, plots a bunch of those, plots the so-called contour map of h. And there's some mistake somewhere. function. Along each one of these curves, capital H is constant in value. In fact, you can find out the values by moving the cursor over the curves. For example, right there, along that level curve, the output of capital H is 13.2. Don't overinterpret the meaning of the number itself. It's not necessarily the energy. It's not necessarily 13.2 joules. Don't overinterpret that. Just say along these curves, your solutions will lie along the curves. Uh, ignore that that's error that you see there. Maybe I need an extra performance goal. Takes a little while to compute it and not make mistakes. Let it go. There we go. You can see those solution curves are on top of the level curves. We saw that d dt of h of, we use x and y, x of t comma y of t, in this case it would be theta of t comma v of t, is zero. If you assume x of t comma y of t is a solution curve. 
We saw that on Wednesday. That's why the solutions have to stay in the level curves. It doesn't tell you what direction they go in. You have to look at the differential equation to see that, or else add in a time effect here. Watch the solution curve. There it is. There it's going counterclockwise. No, clockwise, excuse me. Got mixed up. Up here, it moves to the right as T increases, which you could have guessed by looking at that. Why? Because theta prime is positive when V is positive. Corresponding to a counterclockwise rotation for the pendulum. If V is negative, my initial condition is down here. Sorry for the slowness. Then the curve goes the other way. Theta prime is negative when V is negative. So the ideal pendulum, when you think of it as a system, is a Hamiltonian system. But there are plenty of other Hamiltonian systems that include examples where the right-hand sides include both variables. In fact, you can always very easily make your own very own Hamiltonian system. How? You can first start by creating the H. Where do I want to do that here? There's a bunch of facts here you can see. I don't want to focus on these facts for the moment. Um, just make up some function. It can be anything, pretty much. I might try x cubed times y squared, maybe, plus, plus x squared minus 5y. That could be my H, my Hamiltonian. Once I've got that H, I can find those derivatives, those partial derivatives. Partial derivative with respect to Y is going to be the right-hand side of the first equation, the X dt. Opposite of the partial derivative with respect to the first variable X will be the right-hand side of the second equation. So. If I create a system of differential equations with these right-hand sides, I have created a Hamiltonian system. It doesn't mean it has any applications. It's just an example. Let's go ahead and take a look at the contour map of H. See what it looks like. There it is. Does it have equilibrium points? Probably. You'd have to set these things equal to zero and solve for x and y to see if you can find the equilibrium points. Let me go ahead and do that. f of x, y will be negative 5 plus 2x cubed times y. That's the right-hand side of the dx dt equation. g of x, y. The right-hand side of the dy dt equation will be negative 2x minus 3x squared times y squared. Let's go ahead and add the, the uh, null lines in here with another contour plot. f of xy equals equals 0. g of xy is equal to zero. Interesting. Doesn't doesn't look accurate to me as far as this one goes. Uh, probably want to plot more points, maybe. Make those look nicer. Let's see, I think it's contour points. No, just plot points. Maybe it'll look nicer if I do that. 
Okay. What we're really seeing here is with the y no plane, the blue one here, there's a vertical one, maybe that's the y-axis, along with these two curved ones. Where do red and blue cross? It seems like only there. It seems like probably only one equilibrium point. Bunch, although some are imaginary, it looks like. Let's end solve this instead. Yeah, only one real one. Here's a case where you want to ignore these complex things. Okay, focus on just the real one. Negative 1.56, positive negative 0.65 are the coordinates. Be right there where the red and blue intersect. What about the other solution curves? What if I put a string plot on top of this? Oh, stream style. Let's make our water green this time. Green, so we can see it. Uh, there we go. Look at those stream lines. Can you see very well with the camera from green? Zoom in if you need to. There are a lot of the level curves. In here, you don't see the level curves, but the stream plot effectively is showing you where they are. Contour plot just didn't plot enough of them to see them in here. And your equilibrium point's there. It looks like it's probably a saddle. See that? There'd be a stable separatrix coming in about like that. And an unstable one, I think, of going away about like this, by the looks of it. Looks like a saddle point. We could check that with linearization. I won't take the time to do that. The Hartman Groban theorem would imply that's a saddle. Actually, with Hamiltonian systems, another important thing to realize is you never get sinks or sources. You only get saddles or centers, as long as you are in a non-degenerate case. Ordinary saddles and centers. There are some non-degenerate examples, which are basically kind of weird examples. That can occur when you have zero as an eigenvalue. Can I clarify anything there? Feel like you're getting the main points? I know there's a lot to, to try to digest today. What about if you add friction to the pendulum? For the second order equation, typically we write the friction term as B over M uh, d theta dt forget the, the nonlinear part, g over l sine theta. There's your friction term. The mass comes into play there. What's b? Well, b is just a coefficient of damping. It's measuring how much friction there is. It's just a model. It doesn't necessarily mean it's perfect. You have to compare it with experiments to see if it's perfect. And that might be part of what you do in your project, by the way. You're thinking about your math in the project, and you decide the extra stuff you want to do is an experiment. One thing to look for is does the experiment match the math? Does what you measure match what the math tells you to expect? It tells you how good the model is. For the system, theta prime would still be v. V prime would be negative. G over L sine theta would still be in there, but then also a minus B over M times V. I'm going to take L equal to 1 again, and let's also take M equal to 1. I'm going to use any solve here, and I'm using G equals 9.8, with B. I'm going to use capital B for my time. 
I'm using a lowercase b here. With b as part of one of the parameters for any solve, b is going to be left unspecified. What did the solution curve look like in this case? Uh, that's the wrong contour plot. I need a new h here. Okay, there's the contour map of the original Hamiltonian system. And actually, this is still Hamiltonian initially here because I've set b to be 0. b is the amount of damping. But now I'm going to increase b. Let's see what happens. I'm going to add some damping to make it realistic. A small amount of damping doesn't change things much. Seemingly, oh, well, I, okay, maybe it does change things. Is that accurate or not? Yikes, that's not accurate. Let's let time not go out to, um, to one. Let's see. I'll do 100 here. I'll we'll go out to 5 to start with. Hmm. I let it run again a little, little bit. If it is a periodic solution, it's somehow thicker. Well, that can't happen. So that's either numerical error or it's not a periodic solution. If I add more damping, it becomes more clear that it's not periodic. We've got a spiraling behavior. Damping is occurring. The pendulum is slowing down, heading toward that equilibrium. That equilibrium is a spiral sink. It's no longer a Hamiltonian system. H is no longer a Hamiltonian function for the system. The solution curves are not staying on the low curves. However, H is still helpful to understand the system. Y, the XTT is Y. 
What's dl dx? Or dl dy, excuse me. It's just y. What's dy dt? This is dy dt now. It's negative g over l sine x minus b over m y. Negative g over l. I'm l, taking l equal to 1 and m equal to 1. Negative g sine x minus b y. The terms involving that are g sine x y here and here cancel. All you're left with when you distribute the y through is negative b y squared. b is a positive number and y squared is never negative. This is always less than or equal to zero, no matter what t is for all t. And in fact, it only equals zero when y is zero, or in this picture, when um, v is zero. The only time you get a derivative equal to zero is when you cross the theta axis. Otherwise, solution curves are strictly decreasing, or L is strictly decreasing along solution curves. So it's still helpful to draw the phase portrait when you know this Lyapunov. Okay, these are some pretty high-level ideas. Keep working at it. Um, again, I think, I think starting this weekend, to give you some space, I will now make all of the assignments just completion-based. Okay? And probably that last week you won't even have to turn in. Okay? I'll give you more space to do the project and the reading. See you on Monday.